Welcome to the Wiser Wealth Management Roundtable, where we believe the best financial advice should always be conflict-free. I'm your host, Casey Smith, guiding you to financial freedom, are my co-hosts, Brad Lyons and Matthews Barnett. Hey, guys. Hi, Casey. How's it going? So today's podcast is about maximizing Social Security. And honestly, I wish we could just tell everyone how to do that, and we could just move on. We could go about our day. But unfortunately, Brad, Matthews, they don't always listen. And we have to sell our case on how you should and why you should maximize Social Security. Well, the dynamics of retirement have changed. And a lot of the people who are retiring today are asking for our advice Mm -hmm. and hearing delay your Social Security payments that may be for the first time, whereas all their entire life they've heard about get to age 65, retire, get your Social Security. And so we have a lot to overcome when we are advising people on Social Security today. Yeah, there's a lot of information that people can, can find, but there's also a lot of misinformation and myths. So that's the, the thing that you really have to avoid and make sure if you're doing your own due diligence on that, that you're really thinking through different scenarios and different outcomes. There are several reasons why people don't want to delay Social Security. But I think maybe to be clear, to start off like this, if you take Social Security at 62, you're taking a penalty. If you take Social Security at full retirement age, that's your allotted amount, right? And then if you wait till 70, you actually get an 8% increase per year in benefit to delay from full retirement age to age 70. So that's that's the goal is let's get wait to get a higher payout. But why would you not do that? And, and this is a couple of several things that we hear. One is fear that Social Security will go bankrupt. So they're going to get theirs while they can while there's money in the pot. Right. They want to take it sooner, invest the money and make more money, maybe for cash flow reasons. They just need the additional income. And then the last one is more of an uneducated uh, look at it, I guess. But they just deserve it. They earned it. They're 62. They're getting theirs. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's that's the hardest one to overcome because we're not using math at that point. We're just having to deal with emotions. Let's address those. Let's let's start with the first one. I want to take Social Security sooner because if I don't, the system's going to go bankrupt anyway. What's wrong with that thinking? Well, there's a lot to unpack here. Quite frankly, <laughs> you know, we're dealing with the news and the media that's been saying this now for years and years and years and years. It all had to do with the that the way the baby boom generation moved through the system. When they were behind the Social Security age, they were feeding into the Social Security system. Now that they're into the Social Security and they're taking payments, the generations behind them aren't paying in as much, you know, is, is the storyline. And so that it, the trust account itself is being depleted. But that's not necessarily the case. Well, no, I mean, it, it doesn't help with even financial news media gets it wrong. The headlines recently, just a few weeks ago, said financial security will be depleted or uh, Social Security will be depleted by 2033 instead of 2035. But that's not entirely true. No. Right. So the reason why you think about it, when Social Security started, there was no pot of money. You literally you worked, you put money through your paycheck to cover Social Security, but it wasn't yours. You, there wasn't an account with your name set to the side, and that's the money you put in. The, the system literally started paying for someone else to be retired, right? Right. So that's how it still works today. You pay into Social Security, but it's not your, it, it was never money allotted to you. That money goes to someone else's retirement. Right. There's so, not an accounting function where you have a separate account inside the Social Security fund right. under your name. That's That does not exist. So somewhere a long time ago, uh, I'm sure we could research the history on this, but the point is we created this um, Old Age Survivor Insurance Trust Fund, OASI. OASI was set up to fund the gap. So at some point, like you said, Brad, there were more people working than people retired, and you, or at least dollar-wise, right? Right. Right. So the, the takers were smaller than the givers. Right. So a surplus was being created. Right. So it goes into that trust fund. That trust fund is to cover down the road when there's less people paying in and more people taking. And what we've done is over the years is we've borrowed from, from that trust fund to the point where we're depleting it. Right. Right. Because the return that we're giving back to that fund is less than the cost of living adjustment and the number of people that are retired taking benefits. So as you say, it's being depleted faster than it's being added to. So 76% of the money needed is still coming in. So even if that fund, the old age survivor insurance trust fund dries up to zero, 
we're still receiving 76% just from people working. So the gap we have to cover is that 24%, which is that fund is supposed to do. How do you fix that? Well, I mean, there's a lot of ways you can fix it. You could write a check just like we did for everything else. <laughs> That's a little tongue in cheek. Uh, you could also uh, increase taxes. Uh, Social Security stops coming out of your paycheck around 140 ish thousand dollars a year. You could increase that to 200, 300, 400. And I'm sure they've looked at a lot of these scenarios, but Social Security has always been referred to as the third rail of politics. Nobody wants to touch that third rail. For one, it's been the most successful government program ever, without a doubt. Okay, It has lifted people out of poverty for the past 70, 80 years or so in their retirement. The fact that people are living longer was never considered, I don't think. Back in the 30s when this all started under FDR, the average age, that lifespan of somebody who reached age 65 was only a few more years on a life expectancy. Now, our life expectancy for a male age 65 or 66 is until age 84. And for a woman age 66 today, her average life expectancy is 87. And these are just averages. Now, when you add good health, you add the new technologies that are being, you know, implemented into our healthcare system, you know, life expectancy is expected to continue to rise other than the bump that we've just recently seen. So the, these lifespans, these payout years had never been considered, but it's time to fix this. It, it, it literally is. It's going to take a whole approach of government to try and figure this out. But in the middle of it, we're doing planning for people, trying to make decisions today. Unfortunately, uh, politically, no one really wants to touch it because you're going to have to increase taxes to, to cover it. That That's the bottom line. And no one wants to be that person to, to, to do that, right? The can has been kicked down the road for years. It has, but there's a path. Social Security is, is obviously uh, has been proven to reduce wealth inequality. So maybe you can go at it from that context of, of, okay, hey, we have to fix this because we have people here who really need it, which is very true. I always have this example when clients tell me that, oh, it's going to be broke and it's going to go away. That is not what's going to happen. Yeah, my own grandparents, their primary source of income is Social Security. That's their only source, really. If you drive between Pine Mountain, Georgia, and Rome, Georgia, that's that uh, Georgia-Alabama line, right? You go through there, that's a very poor section of the country, and if you look at that and all those people that live there, I can almost guarantee you they're all their only income is going to be their Social Security checks. That's a lot of Americans. It's 100% of their, their payout in retirement is Social it's, Security. Yeah. Half of current retirees count Social Security for half their income. And for a typical household between 55 and 64, it's 60% 60 of their wealth. So imagine if you took that away, you're literally going to have soup kitchens, food lines. I mean, it would be mayhem. It would, we would look like a third world country yes. at that point. Yes. So and that's why I say it's, it's never going to happen. That There will be some solution. We just don't know what it is. Actually, I got the time. stat right here in front of me. Without Social Security, oh. 20 million Americans would descend into poverty, right? And but, they're living paycheck to paycheck <laughs> on that. Even even making 50% cuts or 75% cuts for the lower tier, that's going to be a, yeah. a big deal. Right. So maybe it starts to get that bad and someone steps in as the savior of Social Security. Maybe we, we look at it that way. I don't know. But the bottom line is that it has to be there. And in fact, when we do financial planning and don't count Social Security for many families, it just doesn't work. We have uh, clients that are working overseas not paying into the system here. They're American citizens, but they're not paying into the Social Security system. And it's a lot harder. A lot of times I tell them, do you really love what you're doing? Because, yes, you're saving on income tax but you're not paying in Social Security, which means you have to save four times as much as everyone else, right? Too much bad news, too much Fox advertisements of why you should buy gold, Social Security's not going to be there, and, and all this fear. You have to stay away from that and start doing your own research and, and, and think about. But I, I do not believe Social Security is going to go away, one, for poverty, but it, it will be solved, and it's probably our client base is going to be paying for that, if I had to guess. If we know that Social Security is not going to go bankrupt, then the next system or the next objection that I often get is I'm going to take the money sooner. I'm going to take it at 62, but I'm not going to spend it. I'm going to pay my income tax on it, whatever, and I'm going to invest that into a portfolio and I'm going to grow it because the thinking is I'll have all these payments from 62 through even 67, which is many people's full retirement age, or 66, or somewhere in the middle, all the way up to age 70, I'm going to get all these, I'll have all these payments instead of having to wait eight years for my Social Security. 
Matthews, you did the math on this. Yeah, to your point there is, you know, what are you investing that in the first place? You know, you'd be speculative in what you're investing in. But if we're just assuming just, uh, you know, a diversified portfolio, we got a few examples here. So a uh, sort of client that might have a $2,000 benefit at full retirement age. For this example, we just assume that's age 67, but you could file early at 62 uh, with a $1,400 benefit uh, or decide to defer till 70 with a $2,480 benefit. So based on this example, you're saving from 62 to 67, that would be about $87,427 saved. If you had a 4% return, that would be 98,342. A 6% return would be 104, 241, uh, and then at 8% would be 110,450. Most likely with a retiree, they're not invested in 100% equities. We probably are more, most likely looking at this, uh, you know, 6% return or so. However, assuming that with the uh, 87,427 uh, invested, you start to look at the difference here uh, from an income standpoint. At age 67, that 62 payment of 1,400 has grown to 1,546. Uh, however, if you waited till age 67 to file, that payment has gone all the way up to 2208. So that's a $662 difference in income there. Now, so like to your point, Casey, of well, I could just go ahead and invest that and that supplemental uh, amount that would grow, I could live on in retirement. However, in order to do that, to replace that income, that would require actually uh, a portfolio of about $160,000. If you're doing the math here, that actually assumes a 21% rate of return, which is probably not likely to ever assume. There are years that that happens, but an average annual return of, of 21% obviously does not make sense. We decided that we would instead uh, not file at 67, uh, but instead file at age 70. Uh, that $1,400 with the cost of living adjustment of 2% has become 1640 at age 70. Uh, however, that age 70 payment has increased to 2,905, which is a significantly bigger gap, as you would assume, uh, which is 1,265 payment. So in order to supplement that gap uh, from 62 to 70, it would require a portfolio of over $303,000, which is an average return of uh, 11%, or excuse me, 17%. Uh, so as you can see here, uh, it would be extremely hard to just decide that you were going to invest that money over that period from 60 two to either 67 or 70 and expect a realistic uh, diversified portfolio for retiree to produce the income that is guaranteed otherwise from social security. Yeah. And I believe the markets will give you uh, a positive rate of return always over, over a 10 plus year period. It, it, it's never not done that. But the problem is that a lot of people who say they're going to do this are, are they're not professional investors. They're, they're investing in individual securities and to get a 21% rate of return per year, is that correct? That's annualized, yeah. That's not month. That's yeah. annualized returns. Annualized returns and have uh, down years as a part of that. That's just impossible. You're not going to be able to get there by investing the money, partially because your target keeps moving up every year. Right, about 8% per year, every <laughs> year guaranteed by the government. That's a right. pretty good return for uh, anybody, but especially a retiree. Plus the cost of living as well. Right. Yeah. So you have the 8% plus the COLA. Yeah. And this year, which in this case this was year, two, they well, handicapped for, it by for, two. For, for 2022, it's 6%. Right. Historically, <laughs> it's changed. Some yeah. years it's been lower than two and around two. But uh, yeah, we're just using the average assumption of around 2% just to keep up with inflation, basically. So the math doesn't work. Thanks for doing that. There you go. The next one is uh, cash flow. And to be honest, this could be legit. If you have no other sources of income, you can't work for some reason, Social Security is all you have, and you're 62 then you may have to take it, but you're handicapping yourself down the road. So you got to make sure you can live well within what that monthly income means is. Otherwise, if you have your own investment accounts, I would uh, also show you the math that you're better off spending down your own assets to delay Social Security for the future. And, and we see that all the time. Uh, it, so I read this one somewhere and I've used it a few times with uh, some of our prospects, but good financial advisors are always going to tell you to delay social security, right? Pay off debt and to uh, uh, be charitable. And, and you think about those things. Those are all three things <laughs> that typically hurt financial advisors because they get paid as a percentage of, of assets under management. Right. So I, I've always taken that to heart. I always make sure we're, we're encouraging to give, delay, <laughs> right, and, and live a debt-free life. And, and those are hard things to hear from a client standpoint. Yeah. They really are. That's true. Yeah. That's true. So not all the advice that you get from a financial planner is, is a uh, 
popular, I'll say. Okay, so if you can cash flow it through other means, you want to delay that. And, and again, that comes back into doing just doing planning and math um, to determine if that's best for you. Well, a lot of people, too, we look at is you hear the 4% rule. So they think just linear throughout retirement, they have to take 4% or less or more. That's not always the case. And you might have a little larger percentage those first few years. Uh, but as long as the numbers make sense, which in most cases they do, then that's fine. As long as after that, that you, after you claim Social Security, that amount decreases slightly. This one I have a hard time with when I hear it. But deserve, I deserve it. I'm just going to take it because I've worked for it and I earned it and I'm going to get I'm going to get it back. That's the hardest one to overcome because you're dealing with a person who doesn't think logical. It, it's an emotional thought process. I understand it. Maybe you're just fed up <laughs> and you want your check, dadgummit. But it does. There, there's just no. There's no basis to it. There's very little math there. That is, like you said, that's just an emotional <laughs> yeah. decision where you've kind of yeah. decided you want to get your money back. So we'll throw in some exceptions here. The articles that I could find on the internet that were for taking Social Security, even at 62, but certainly at full retirement age, they were all based on a mortality rate that was probably lower than what um, we would ever assume. We always assume a client's going to live to age 95 unless they prove otherwise, right? And they prove otherwise by saying, you know, look at me. <laughs> <laughs> or no my family's ever lived past... Um, you know, 75 years old and, or, 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 or maybe you're sit, sitting there talking to someone who's just in really poor health, not, not like a terminal condition, but it's clear based on medical history. I'm kind of proud to say that we, we have some people who served this country really, really well. Vietnam veterans. We, we, I love working with these guys that they, they, they are heroes. We have several clients that, that were not filing papers. They were on the ground. They were on the ground, landing in the helicopters, running through the trees, uh, or the jungle, I should say. Uh, and, and because of that, they have some health issues that are telling me that they're not going to probably make it past 85 or even 80, right? And so medicine's getting better, and they get great health care. Uh, but in that case, maybe taking Social Security at full retirement makes sense uh, for them. Certainly not early, but maybe that makes sense. But outside of that, you're going to live longer than you think. Well, we hope so, but we live in a, a world of instant gratification. And that first Social Security paycheck, that's instant gratification, right? True. Yeah. And so it, it's, there's a lot to overcome there. It makes a lot of sense. I mean, you know, we, we're in this business. We see it. We work the numbers over and over and over. And we see it come true time and time again. So when, when we're talking to clients, it's, it's because not because their own situation, it's because of all the other situations that we're, we're bringing to the table with us as well. All the experience of people getting to retirement and it being advised through retirement. And so for us, it's, it's becoming kind of second nature, if not already, that we want to defer Social Security for as long as possible in order to get that longer, larger payout. But it's our job to continue to, to stress this point, to have podcasts like this, to provide information. Matthew's had a great word earlier. We hear all the time in society today, that's disinformation, you know, that, that tells people, take your Social Security, Social Security is going to go bankrupt, you know. And it's just that. It's just disinformation. Uh, and what we can provide is, is full information based upon circumstances where we see time and time again, delaying payments for as long as you can ends up to your benefit. The math behind this is if you retire at 62, you're reducing your payment by 25 to 30% based on your full retirement age. Right. If you wait till 70, you could get 32% more based on your full retirement age. There's going to be a break even, and we can calculate that. You can calculate, there's actually a website that'll help you do that. Usually it's between 78 and 80 for most people. So if you live between 78 and 80 years old, then the government's paying you more than what you would have received if you had taken it sooner. I, I think most people are going to make it to 78 to 80, according well, to well, uh, well, we just saw stats, in, the, in right? the mortality tables that somebody age 65 or 66 today is going to live to between 84 and 87, whether male, male or female. So right off the bat, just the math there, the numbers say that you're going to be ahead of the game. And, and that's obviously there's not always the case, different scenarios based on their circumstances or maybe spouses, age and income as well. But yeah, for the average majority, that's what we're seeing. And our goal is usually to run the plans through age 95. So unless we have details otherwise, um, you know, that's what we're looking at. We want people living a full life. I, I encourage clients a lot of times to, uh, well, not 
it was easier pre COVID, but take the trip, do, do what you want to do. You have today, you're not guaranteed tomorrow. Uh, don't, don't sit here looking at your nest egg going, Oh, I got to protect this next debt or I can't, I can't spend any money th this month. Very few of our clients are living lives like that. So you, you got to do the things that are on your list because again, you're not guaranteed uh, tomorrow, but I'd much rather you leave us sooner well-equipped to have been here longer. <laughs> Does that make sense? We, we don't want anybody ever, <laughs> you know, living and then out of money because we said, oh, I'll be dead by 75 and here you are at 90, right? Right. Uh, that, that could be very bad, especially 90 and in, in, in reasonable health. Let's say that we have a male married to a female. Uh, the wife did not work or she worked very little. So her social security maybe is $800 a month where the man was working, uh, you know, the full social security requirements and is getting uh, $2,500 a month, let's say. She is eligible for half of his benefit or all of hers. What would happen is she would not file her own. She would uh, actually just take half of his social security. When he passes away, she has a choice. She can take all of hers or all of his, but she loses one, right? So in that scenario, if he were to delay until age 70, and let's say he got, uh, he's getting $3,000 a month now, I'm just making up a number, that's $500 more per month that she would be getting as she lives out her life. So let's say, you know, men, we typically do stupid things earlier in life, so we tend to die sooner at the end because of that. So therefore, uh, let's say she's going to live 10 plus years as a widow. By delaying his Social Security, she's able to collect more in the future. That can be a big help with assisted living, uh, nursing home, health care, quality of life in general, right, by delaying that. Uh, and that goes exceptionally true when you have a spouse that's 10 years younger than you, a whole decade, and you start doing that math, you realize that, yeah, I need to be waiting till age 70, right, and also have a good life insurance policy. But a lot of times I don't have that. <laughs> <laughs> so we're left with, with social security math is all, is all we have. So that's another reason. Um, another thing that, uh, again, this is, um, I guess, more of an advanced discussion is you can receive a benefit on your ex-spouse that, that doesn't affect their benefit at all. So if you've been married to someone, I believe the number is 10 years, 10 years or longer, you have the op option of taking half of their social security instead of all of yours as well. So something to think about um, on a social security front there. The bottom line is for most people, at least most people that probably listen to wealth management podcast and most people that do business with wealth management firms, uh, you want to wait to age 70. Again, the problem is no one believes us. So we have to go through these steps in a conversation and we have software that, show, that does all the math for us. We simply put in all their uh, criteria, and it'll tell them the optimal Social Security strategy. It's gotten a little easier. There are a ton of options out there, but when there was the file and suspend option, which a lot of people still ask about, that threw another kink in things, and sometimes the math would work out uh, when you're able to file based on your spouse and then uh, apply later on. But when that was done away with a few years ago, it did make it a little more simpler. So now there are a little less options. But yeah, you're correct. Uh, you know, If you're able to with the, within the plan and it makes sense, take the bigger benefit and wait till 70. And then when you get into disability and minor children and you're at retirement age, it, it opens up a whole Pandora's box of Social Security options. In fact, there, there's a book on my desk or in my office. There's 505 ways to take Social Security. Yeah, I mean, the, the <laughs> matrix of decision making is unbelievable for, for Social Security elections. And the thing is, once you make your election and you start taking payments, you cannot change. Your circumstance may change. But you cannot change without some significant financial payback. <laughs> That's a good point, Brad. We have stopped people from taking Social Security when they applied, but they hadn't received a payment yet. Once right. you start receiving payments, you're kind of on that on that path. You kind of have to make do with what you yeah. that situation that you're yes. in. Yes. That, so that gets locked in, although your life continues to change. Right. right. And your circumstances do. So that's why Social Security, quite frankly, gives us that many options. You know, to, to, right. to fit our, our different lifestyles. But the key is, is to be able to ask those questions and to find somebody, if not the Social Security Administration itself into their, their service center, somebody who can help with you answering those questions, you know. I want to go back to the portfolio section 
for a second, the, the math behind all this. Think about this. You you have a million dollar uh, in, in investments as a Roth, IRAs, brokerage, whatever. It doesn't matter where it is. It's just, a, you know, it adds up to about a million dollars in assets, even a half million. What you would do is delay taking the Social Security. You would spend down some of your own assets for a little while for maybe, let's say, let's use the full term if we're talking about 62, eight years. Then on the other end, for many people, they stop taking money out of your portfolio or very little out of their portfolio. RMD may be it. That might be. Right. So so then your portfolio grows for another 10, 15 years until inflation kind of kicks in. And you have to pull more money out of your out of your portfolio. We see that scenario quite a bit for people who live very uh, modest lifestyles. Uh, two spouses have been working. You're looking at nearly $60,000 just in Social Security. If you had a small pension on top of that, you you could get to $100,000 in guaranteed money, right? So, again, if you don't have the pension, you have smaller Social Security, which we see with business owners. Their Social Security tends to be smaller. You're pulling out of uh, that pot, and waiting is typically uh, beneficial. This is the importance of financial planning. This, it's important to not figure this out at the 12th hour, but you know several years in advance what your game plan is and how you want to execute that. The good news is you don't have to make a decision that day. You can decide to take it at full retirement age. You can take it at 68. You can take it at 69. <laughs> right. You can think about it every month if you want to. Every month you can say, do I take Social Security today or not? Right. Now, once you get to 70, I think most people know this, you should take it because at 71, you just lost a whole year's worth of payments. You'll never get those back. Right. I only know of one person who just never took it. He was 73 and decided he better sign up for it. <laughs> I only know one person who did that. <laughs> you mean they don't pay you back for all those years? <laughs> no, they should. They should, but they don't. All right, guys. Good discussion. Enjoyed it. Yep. See you next time. Thanks for listening to the Wiser Roundtable podcast. We hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe wherever you're listening. That way you don't miss out on new episodes. Head to wiserinvestor.com and reach out if you have any questions. We would love to hear from you. Today's episode was produced and edited by Lilton Moore. Wiser Wealth Management Incorporated is a registered investment advisor. Information presented is for educational purposes only and does not intend to make an offer or solicitation for the sale or purchase of any specific securities, investments, or investment strategies. Investments involve risk and unless otherwise stated are not guaranteed. Be sure to first consult with a qualified financial advisor and or tax professional before implementing any strategy discussed herein. Past performance is not indicative of future performance.